And I get asked all the time, if you had to pick one thing that's the key to your success, what would it be? And I would say, hands down, work ethic. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. All righty, welcome back to another episode of Our Stories, the Kansas City Sports Network podcast on women, sports, in Kansas City. The show is presented by our friends at Holiday Distillery. And today's guest, if you've played or paid attention to basketball in Missouri or Kansas or honestly anywhere in the country, uh, she needs no introduction. Former WNBA All-Star, Rookie of the Year, and D1 scoring record holder, also a Final Four uh, team leader, Jackie Siles. Jackie, welcome. So thank you so much for joining us. I uh, sure appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, you know, I grew up playing basketball in Kansas City, and I think my first uh, first exposure to you was the my club coaches telling me, well, Jackie Styles, if you want to be like her, she made a thousand shots every single day. <laughs> um, so <laughs> never got into that rhythm. But uh, I wanted to just start with uh, your very earliest introductions to basketball in uh, Claflin, Kansas. Yeah, I was very fortunate that my dad was a basketball coach and he coached the varsity boys at my high school. And so I would follow him to the gym when I was a little girl and he'd show me a fundamental, you know, on the side. And I, I couldn't wait to show him that, you know, I could master it. And um, so I fell in love with basketball very young. And I really think it was because of his influence and, and just hanging around the gym with his teams. And then I actually told my second grade teacher that I was going to play professional basketball when I grew up. And that was before they even had professional basketball in the U S yeah. I could go overseas, but I just had that vision that basketball was what I wanted to be really good at. And it was my passion. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, the WNBA didn't even exist at that time. There were opportunities to play, you know, overseas a little bit, but um, yeah, that's, that's so incredible. You had that, uh, I guess, vision as a second grader. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, now looking back, you know, it took me a while then to kind of find my second career when I was done playing. And I realized now yeah. what a blessing that was that I knew exactly what yeah. I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, so and I was so fortunate that I did get to play a couple years professionally before my body kind of gave out on me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think last time we talked to you were saying you were like interested in coaching clinics and things when you were that age, when you were in second grade, you go with your dad and that kind of stuff. Yes, I would. I mean, I know what second grader wants to go sit with their dad at a coach, but I just, I just couldn't get enough of basketball. I mean, that's all I thought about every single day. How could I be the best basketball player I could possibly become? Yeah, pretty cool to know your calling that early in life. Yeah. yeah. Um, people spend their whole lives without knowing, you know, their calling as clearly as you did when you were in second grade. Well, um, my calling couldn't last my whole life. So then it was sure. hard one, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm excited to talk about that later too. Uh, Cause I think the transition out of basketball and out of um, college athletics is very difficult for uh, a lot of people. So I'm interested to hear, you know, kind of how you navigated that process. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, your high school career and the story behind, you know, the, the legend, which is making a thousand shots every single day while you were in high school. Yeah, so basically that started my uh, sophomore year. Um, it was the third game of the season. I broke my wrist, and I was just devastated at that time because I had to sit out four weeks with a cast past my elbow. And in those four weeks then, I taught myself how to play left-handed because I convinced my doctor to let me play the second four weeks still with a cast past my elbow, um, so where I really only had to use my left hand for pretty much everything because I couldn't straighten my arm. So I played – I got the cast off right before playoffs, and my whole goal in high school was I wanted to win a state championship more than anything. And here we are, um, semis of the state tournament we win, we'll play for the championship, and I had the worst performance of my career. I mean, so bad that I still to this day remember what I was from the field, and that was a lot of years ago. I won't date myself, <laughs> but I was uh, four out of 21 shots, and you know, we only lost by you know a couple points, and so I was just embarrassed and devastated, and um, I decided at that moment I wanted to even be better than before that injury. And that's when I vowed to make 
a thousand shots every single day. And I did that from my sophomore year in high school till my freshman year in college. And then my college coach was like, you're not going to have any legs left if you try yeah. to get <laughs> that routine. And so I developed more of a quality over quantity um, workout after that point. But yeah, I wish I would have had the gun like they do now. Um, yeah, I, that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So. So how long did that take you making a thousand shots without a gun? Uh, yeah, it took four hours with a toss back, you know, and like yeah. kids these days don't even know what a toss back is. But um, <laughs> yeah, and then if I That's could the one like the, the balls roll down back out to you, right? On the net. Yeah, it's a is, okay. yeah and then if you, yeah. if you miss it, it'll kind of ricochet off the side of it and you have to run after it. But yeah. if you make it, it'll slowly bounce back to you from the net. So yeah, it's not a very, very efficient way to make, you know, your thousand shots. But then um, if I could, you know, bribe one of my younger siblings to rebound, then it would cut it in half, about two, two and a half hours to, to make the 1,000 shots. So, Gosh, yeah. I grew up playing on the – shooting on the gun, and that thing would drive me nuts because, you know, if you hit one heart off the rim, it's going across the gym. But I can't imagine – that quantity with, you know, the toss back or maybe a, maybe a little sibling if you're lucky that day. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so how long did it take you with the gun? Oh, oh man. A thousand. Yeah. Wouldn't do a thousand. It would probably okay. take me, <laughs> probably take me, man, like an hour to do like 200 or so. I think, I mean, I haven't done that for a long time, but um, yeah, having the gun certainly would have expedited your process, I think. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't the only thing you did. You were in the gym constantly, but you were also a really successful track star. Um, did you do a fall sport? Uh, so yeah, I did uh, cross country and tennis in the fall. Um, and then basketball, of course, in the winter and then track in the spring. So I was yeah. able to do four sports, you know, being in a, from a small town, you know, we pretty much did all the sports because you had to, to be able to have teams, you know, there's a hundred in my high school, so um, yeah. much everybody did everything. And so I'm, I'm so thank thankful I did because, you know, I still to this day play tennis and that led me into pickleball. Um, so those are some life lifelong sports that have, have stayed with me. And I, I it was a love hate relationship with running. Um, you oh, know, I, I'm so glad I did it and made me a better athlete and made me tougher, but it's always a, a hard sport. And I was uh, thankful to be done with every meet. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you also, wouldn't you dribble around town and that kind of thing, Claflin? Yes, I would. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like when I was running, uh, you know, for cross country, you know, it was a city loop was two and a half miles around my town. And, you know, a lot of times with like in two sports, like I'm, I'm in tennis practice and, you know, maybe I go eat and then I make my thousand shots. Sometimes I'd be running late at night uh, for my cross country workout. So I'd be dri dribbling my ball um, around town while I was running that, that city loop. I'm sure um, Claflin, uh, you know, people loved, you know, hearing that ball bounce in it, you know, <laughs> at night when they're trying to sleep. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I talked to uh, your coach, Cheryl Burnett, for an interview I did last year for the uh, this Title IX series I did where you were in it also. Um, and she talked about recruiting you. You were pretty young when you started catching eyes of college coaches. Yeah, so it was very um, – actually, I, I just know I was meant to be a Bear because I was playing in my very first AU tournament in Emporia, Kansas, and my dad had begged my way onto this team out of Kansas City. So we were driving, you know, four hours each way – to play on this team every weekend about cause of divorce with my mom and dad because my mom thought he was absolutely oh, no. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Eight hours every weekend to be on this team, but sure. uh, but it worked out because my very first game, um, there happened to be a coach from Missouri State. She was there to watch the older girls play, and she leans over to my dad and says, "Who's at number five? And my dad's like, "Well, that's my daughter." And so I had just got done watching them play in their first Final Four. This was the spring after they made their Final Four, and this was in '92. And She's like, if you keep working, you could, you know, play Division One basketball. And, um, you know, we'd love to have you come to camp. So I started coming to camp there and they started writing me letters because I wasn't in high school yet. And that's really the reason I believe I ended up going there. I think if they would have started recruiting me when everybody else did, I probably wouldn't have chose Missouri State. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that that happened and, and it really motivated me, you know, that time in my life. Yeah, and in hindsight, I mean, gosh, everything happens for a reason because of the, the career you had there, which is unbelievable. Um, and also, what grade were you in? I, I think I know this from what uh, Coach told me, but what grade were you in when you played with that in that first AU tournament? Uh, uh, seventh grade. Same yeah. Grade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. seventh grade and getting recruited, um, or at least being spotted, you know, that early is just wild. Uh, so you talked a little bit about what made your decision to uh, to go to Southwest Missouri State, but the recruiting process – 
was it a 100% I'm going there or did you have other schools you were kind of considering? Uh, no, it, I definitely, um, I didn't handle the recruiting process very well. I had a hard time saying no. And, um, you know, no one at that point had been highly recruited from Claflin. So there was really no one to kind of learn from on how to handle oh, that so process. so stressful. Yeah. yeah. And it just, you know, that's the biggest decision um, at that point that you're going to, you know, make, you know, when you're 17 or however old I was at, as a senior in high school. And it's a huge yeah. decision, you know. And so I ended up having 18 home visits in 19 days in the fall oh my of my year. And that's on top of doing two sports. You know, I was doing cross country, yeah. tennis, and then – um, you know, and at Claflin, like it's two hours from the air main airport, which is Wichita. Yeah. And so, um, it ended up that these coaches were flying into Great Bend a lot of the times and Great Bend had only had one rental car. And so like day after day, these coaches would pull up in the same rental car, I think they were <laughs> trading it off, you know, but, yeah. um, I finally narrowed to four schools and it was Missouri state, Yukon, uh, Kansas state and Oklahoma. And, I really struggled at this point because I, I just felt like all those schools would have been a, a good for, fit for me. But I, I just finally was able to say, you know what, I want to go to Southwest Missouri State, now Missouri State. And, you know, everybody was disappointed in my decision because I had a lot of pressure to stay in state with Kansas State. And mm -hmm. of course, when I would mention UConn, they'd be like, are you crazy to turn them down? But uh, yeah. I, I just knew I won. I wanted my family to be a part of my experience and watch me play in person and there's no way they would have been able to afford to go to you know Connecticut to watch me play much and um you know it just I just knew that um Missouri State um coach Burnett would push me to bring out the best of me on and off the floor and I, I wanted that I wanted somebody that would really push me and I knew they'd been to a final four before and you know I, it just felt like it was the right fit and you know it was the best decision in my life I had most incredible four years playing there so yeah and as we know now it was obviously the right choice but that had to be difficult at 17 18 you know going against the grain and having that much national attention on your decision and to just stick with what you know is right um it's pretty impressive for how stressful that entire process is oh yeah and and it just shows like i guess one you know big lesson i learned from that is you know you can listen to where everybody else wants you to go but you are the one that has to you know deal with that decision. You're the one that lives with that decision. And, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, but it, you just listen to everybody's opinion, but you got to really truly follow your heart and your gut. And usually it'll never lead you uh, down the wrong path. If, if you do what is truly best for you and not um, get so concerned with what everybody else's outside opinion is, but yes, it was very difficult at the time, you know, going against the grain, really yeah. no one's first choice was Missouri State, except for the, that program, the coaches, um, yeah. my parents, everybody else had different opinions of where I should go, but it ended up working out. So yeah, well, and thank goodness that was before the days of social media too, because oh, <laughs> it's just Imagine, a yeah. chaos level to, but um Awesome. So you landed Southwest Missouri State. Oh, also in your recruiting process, wasn't there a psychic involved at one point? Oh, yes, for sure. I, <laughs> that's a story. Um, I saw a psychic hotline advertised and, you know, I was had it narrowed before and I was really struggling. And, you know, I'm like, OK, that's it. I'm going to call this psychic. It was like so many free minutes, you know, and so they're yeah. trying to ask me all these questions. I'm like, nope. I have one question for you. I cannot decide where to go to college basketball. These are my four schools. <laughs> And so the psychic's like, well, personally, I'm a Tennessee Lady Vols fan, so I'd like to see you go there. And I, you know, so needless to say, you know, it really didn't help. She's like, I, I guess choose UConn. So, so yeah. Talk about the worst psychic ever. Like, <laughs> I, I think I did, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's um, why it's free, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you get to Southwest Missouri State, which is now Missouri State right now. But um, did it live up to everything you would hoped it would be? Oh yeah, um, and then some. You know, just yeah. that. And what made it so special is the people. And I always tell people that are trying to make that decision of where to go to college. Expect, yeah, you definitely need your degree that you're interested in. But a lot of people don't know exactly what they want to major in, you know, yeah. when they decide on a school. And it's really all about the people and how you fit, you know, with the coaching staff, the players that are there, um, you know, the kind of uh, program that they run. And, and then also just the community of uh, Springfield made it so incredibly special the way they supported, um, you know, our basketball program. And it drove you to work that much harder because you wanted to make them proud. It was just how much they appreciated, you know, what we did on the court. And, you know, and, and we appreciated all the support they gave us. And so, you know, it was just a, a really amazing environment to play women's college basketball. Yeah. And that was such an exciting period of 
of women's basketball for, you know, the 96 Olympics was kind of a springboard. The WNBA started, you know, the next year. And you were the face of this really exciting thing going on, this mid-major Cinderella that, you know, everyone could look at Jackie Styles and the Lady Bears and kind of have someone to root for. Um, and the national attention was really heating up when you were approaching the D1 scoring record. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was yeah. definitely a wild experience. And, <laughs> um, and, and I'm just like, you know, so proud of our team and what we were able to accomplish because yeah. I, I believe there's not been a mid-major since ours make it to the Final Four, and that's 21 years. And, um, you know, what I realized, what made that team so special is, I mean, you know, we were able to beat teams that were way more talented than us, but, you know, we had, um, you know, we were all unselfish. We played for each other, and we were, we were great friends, you know, off the court too, and I, and I believe that matters. And we just had a 20-year reunion a year ago and all oh. got together in Asheville, North Carolina, that team. And we're, all of us girls are in one uh, house, and, you know, you would have thought we didn't miss a beat. I mean, we got along mm -hmm. seamlessly, and, you know, to put that many girls in a house for, you know, four <laughs> days and not have any what's, issues whatsoever, I mean, that's what <laughs> really made us special. But, yeah, the, the spotlight on – the record was a lot of pressure and it was just honestly a relief um, when it was over because I've never focused on the individual records. It's always how can I help our team win? And, you know, I, that my role was, um, you know, putting putting the ball in the basket. I mean, that was my gift, but um, yeah. I, I didn't want it to take away from the other seniors. And I was able to break the record the day of the game before senior night, which I was thankful for because, they all had an incredible career and I didn't want to take away from that. Sure. Yeah. Gosh, what an unselfish way to, to look at that. I had never heard it was right before that senior night game. Do you know how many points you had to score to, to get it? Uh, 20. And, and it was, uh, yeah. yeah. And you know, everybody was, you know, just expecting it to happen to the point where they printed like 10,000 pictures with the date that I broke the record on before the game and handed those out after the game. And I'm just like, Gosh, thank goodness. I <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to throw all these away if you don't yeah, do it. Yeah. It was against Creighton, and they were known as a really good defensive team. And so yeah. um, I, I was thankful that it, it worked out and I was able to break it at home in front of our home crowd. So, yeah. Yeah. And I know we had talked before about how uh, you discovered you had a security guard after a game. Uh, yeah. No, they hired a professional bodyguard starting in Wichita, <laughs> which I had to score, I think, think, oh, close to 50 points, high 40s to, um, you know, break the record. And so, I mean, they people thought there was a shot that I could potentially do it, which I'll say. But they, uh, I remember um, after right after the game, I had this guy with his earpiece and following me around and, you know, like telling people no on autographs and different things. I'm like, what in the world is this? And I hired a professional bodyguard just because I was having a hard time warming up for games with the fans. Um, coming down to want, you know, pictures and autographs and stuff. It, it seems like a separate life. Uh, <laughs> about this, but, uh, but yeah, so from that point on, um, I had a, a bodyguard and um, my teammates love to, you know, they got a hold of that <laughs> one and, and ran with that, making fun of that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Gosh, how, I guess, how cool is that, you know, um, to have the nation's eyes on you? I know it was obviously a lot of pressure as well, but such a cool moment for women's basketball to have, you know, 10,000 people at a game just kind of waiting for you to, to make history. Yeah, it, it was really cool moment and uh, something I'll, I'll never forget. And it's just a, a credit to, um, you know, the people I had surrounding me. You can't accomplish anything great alone. And I just have had such incredible teammates and coaches and throughout my whole journey. And then, you know, just like I said, the fans and the community, all the support they gave me. And even growing up in small town Kansas where, you know, I would be trying out for different USA teams and the, the um, community would uh, gather and give me some money to go on those yeah. trips and just do things like that where that, you know, just drove me to even be uh, better because like I said, I, I just wanted to make them proud for um, all the support and how they invested in me and in my um, career. Yeah, there's something special about being from a small town in Kansas. For sure. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for, you know, my upbringing. I'm, I'm sold on that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you guys obviously had high hopes going into that 2001 season. Um, I guess tell me about the Final Four ride. I, I know it was a – you guys were filling airports, selling out crowds. What what was that like? Uh, it was just uh... – something like you would see in the movies it was just like incredible yeah. it was a fairy tale really um because you know here 
um, we make the final four and we land in Springfield and this is before 9-11. And so people could, you know, go right to our gate. And when we step off the plane, it's pandemonium, you know, and, you know, it's a 10 gate airport. It usually takes us 10 minutes to get through it. And it took us two hours. I mean, mm. you know, just people were just jam packed in there. You couldn't even walk. And I mean, it, you know, people are fighting to get our picture and autograph. I remember USA Today was there, just all these major outlets. And then here, then we're uh, playing in the final four in St. Louis. Like literally we bust to the final four. So now we're not only are we a Cinderella, but we're the hometown team. And I just remember our bus driving down St. Louis and people screaming when they found out it was our <laughs> bus. And, and then we had a, a mandatory autograph session when, um, you know, before the game and, and basically it was us and UConn and I look over and there's no one in UConn's line and there's everyone in our line fighting over our autographs. So it was, it, it was wild um, just to see the outpour of, of support. And I, I believe we set a record for um, attendance at an open practice um, at that point. So wow. it, it was a really cool moment to live through for sure and something I'll never forget. Yeah, that really is out of a movie. Um, yeah. Do you, What seed were you guys? Uh, we're the fifth seed, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, we thought we were even going to get to host because we were ranked at that yeah. time. Um, really had never lost two games in a row and had some um, big wins against some top 20 teams. But um, unfortunately, we got sent all the way to New Jersey for our first two rounds. So it, it was a tough travel stretch because we went to uh, New Jersey for our first two and then Spokane, Washington. So really, literally, you know, one, you know, across the country, you know, um, so that travel was hard, but then we got to go to the final four right in our um, home state. But, but yeah, it, it was a memorable run for sure. So yeah, man, having to travel that far yeah. for rounds one and two, that's not easy on the body. No, no, for, it wasn't for sure. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that final four ride, just the, the media around it and the fans around it. How cool is that for just women's basketball at the time, you know, where popularity was really taken off. Oh yeah. Very, very cool. Um, you know, to see that and to see um, so many people, you know, excited uh, about our sport. And, you know, I've heard from several people that, you know, would say uh, their son was out in the back backyard um, trying to be me, me you know, they're like, yeah. I'm, you know, Jackie Styles, you know, to shoot the last night shot. Just to hear those stories where even uh, little boys were trying to be like me. I, yeah. I just, you know, it was, it was really cool and, and to be uh, like our team. And um, so it was just something that, you know, never forget. But again, it was a credit to so many incredible people involved um, with our team in that run. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you guys got knocked out in the final four round, but um, man, what a ride. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, I will never be able to watch that game. Uh, we got yeah. to do. do. Uh, and I just feel like we really ran out of gas. I mean, we could have competed with any mm -hmm. of those teams, but we were the only team there that didn't get to host the first two rounds. So I think the travel caught up with us you know, a bit, but, you know, I have no regrets. I know we yeah. gave it everything we had, um, you know, in that moment. And I always tell kids, you know, if you always just do your best, you know, give your best, you won't have any regrets, no matter the outcome, you know, you, you just always have to give your best. And I, I love the saying, win the day, Let's just try to get a little bit better every single day and, and good things will happen for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, that was your was that your senior season you guys went to the final four yes yes yeah. yeah so after that uh did you know the WNBA was the next step uh well i i hoped you know um <laughs> but i got to go out to the draft and yeah. that was a pretty cool experience with my you know head coach at uh, coach burnett my family and um so i got to be there but pretty nerve-wracking because you're sitting in a room and you have no idea where you're gonna go live um, yeah, you know, yeah. Or, or if, if your name's going to get called, you know, um, and so, uh, fortunately I was the fourth pick, um, for the Portland fire and, um, you know, talk about an incredible moment to get paid, to play basketball, to get paid to something I absolutely love to do and never considered it work because I, I loved it so much. So yeah, it, it was definitely a, a great experience for sure. Yeah. And to be able to become that role model, you didn't have when you were a kid, you know, people can look up to Jackie Styles in the WNBA, but you didn't really have any pro women you could watch. Yeah. Like starting out, I, you know, my, the people I looked up to were Michael Jordan and yeah. I love Larry Bird and uh, Pistol Pete. I read all of his books and I just felt like I really saw myself in him and how he practiced. I'm never, I'm not near as good as Pistol Pete, but just how he thought about the game and how he practiced. I, I just, 
saw a little, a lot of similarities. Um, but then it wasn't until really later in my career um, that I could kind of look up to a, you know, Cynthia Cooper, or Cheryl Swoops, you know, because it just, you know, didn't exist when I started playing. Yeah. What did it mean to you to know you had that boy in the backyard, you know, doing the buzzer beaters with Jackie Styles and that kind of thing? Just knowing you were that person now for, for it, it was really, really, I mean, just one yeah. mind blowing, like really that this, this is happening. And I'll never <laughs> forget when I first saw um, somebody wearing my Jersey, I was like, wow, they're wearing my Jersey. And then the moment I'm like, is this real life is when I was in a Walmart and I don't know if you remember when they had the, the poster section at oh, yeah, Walmart. Yeah. and I, I was like in the poster section at Walmart. <laughs> like, what? Like, wow. <laughs> like, you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's, awesome. that's when you know you made it when you have a poster <laughs> at Walmart. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, how was your first year in the WNBA? I know you were obviously rookie of the year, had, had a heck of a season. Uh, you know, it was, it was a hard adjustment at first um, yeah. because it, it's another level as far as athleticism and speed and the size of the game and, or, you know, the size of the players and the speed of the game, it, mm -hmm. that was a little bit of adjustment. And, you know, um, you know, it took me a couple games, but I then finally just had this breakout game and that just gave me that confidence. That, okay. You know, I, I can, I can play at this level. Um but, you know, I always tell people I would have traded in all my contracts to have another four years of mm. college basketball because it's just different when um, money's involved. It was a little bit more of a selfish environment. I mean, it's still a dream job, but yeah. um, so that made it different. And then just the different ages. Like, so in college, you know, you're having pregame meals together, you're training together. In the pros, it's more of a business-like atmosphere where they're just saying, okay, be at the game at 5.30 and, um, you know, you are on your own for – your meal pregame meals and and things mm -hmm. like that so it's just a little different because you know there might be me that was a 22 23 year old and then somebody that's you know 30s and has a family so um yeah. it's just a little different environment than the college atmosphere yeah and springfield was like that family town it sounded like i mean yeah. you guys had so many fans at your games and yeah, yeah. um I, you know, and I'm curious too with your, with your scoring record. Would you credit that to what happened your sophomore year, where you just started um, doing the thousand shots a day routine, or, or was it a natural gift, or kind of a combination of, of both for the for the person who wants to be the next Jackie Styles? Well, I think um, it was a lot of things, but I think um, my story is relatable because when people see me, they see how small I am. Like, no yeah. one has ever said you must be a professional basketball player. <laughs> I, I have never heard that one time. Yeah. Um, you know, so are you a cheerleader? Are you a tennis oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> professional basketball player? So, yeah. um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, gives other players, um, you know, hope that, you know, you don't have to be really tall. You don't have to be the most athletic player on the court. If you have a dream and you believe in yourself and you're willing to work and invest, like you can do what other people would think is, is impossible if if you're willing to really you know sacrifice and and, and put the work in but I'll, I'll tell you it was worth every second you know i, I was wasn't where very balanced the first half of my career but the things i got to do i mean i i never imagined how basketball would bless me i mean i, I always tell people i've never gotten a real job ever i mean basketball's paid the bills for me um and you know just the probably the greatest thing about playing sports is the people you get to meet and the yeah you know, people you're exposed to. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely tell any, any young player that it is worth it. And it doesn't matter what other people think you can do because no one ever thought one, I could even play division one basketball being from Claflin, uh, they sure. said, go to a bigger school. And then, you know, it was like, okay, well, you're never going to be an all American going to a Missouri state, a mid-major, you won't make a final four. And, you know, I was always that underdog, but I just, use that as fuel. And my internal goal was to be the best to ever play the game, which sounds crazy. So I was at, oh, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I didn't reach that, but I was that person that like, you know, I didn't want to take that day off because I didn't want yeah. someone working harder than me. And that's why, I, why I could walk away from my career, even though it didn't end how I wanted to end with zero regret, because I know I gave it everything I had. And and, you know, sports is such a short window of your life. And sometimes yeah. you realize how special it is until it's over. And so that's why I'm always at camps telling these young players that, hey, you know, sometimes you don't want to be at practice, but 
just you have to be there anyway. So get, give your best and and just cherish these moments. Have fun. Don't put so much pressure on yourself because it, it doesn't last very long. And some of your lifelong friendships will come from, you know, people that you played with on different teams. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you decided to call it a career in the WNBA, that was more out of your hands just because of surgeries and things. Yeah. Injuries. Yeah. Injuries. I mean, I had 13 uh, surgeries, tried to make one come back uh, to play in Australia in 2006. And then it was like the doctor said I needed left knee surgery. And that was a completely new injury. So I just knew that, you know, my, yeah. my mind wanted to do it, but my body couldn't do it anymore. And it wasn't how I wanted to end, you know, not on my own terms. But um, like I said, I, I knew I'd given it everything I had uh, to, you know, to hold on and to try to, yeah. to play. So, yeah easier to come to terms with stuff like that when you know, yeah, you couldn't have done anything else. Anything else, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the transition out of sports like for you? Because I've had this conversation with a couple like highly successful athletes and it's difficult sometimes when your identity is so wrapped up in, you know, your sport and your success in your sport and the routine you have. Um, was the transition out of that difficult for you? Uh, very difficult, yes. Um, yeah. Because I, I really got up every single day thinking about how can I be the best basketball player I can become? And I thought about nothing else. Like my mom tried to make me more, more balanced. She entered me in Girl Scouts and 4-H and just, but I was just obsessed with sports and, and basketball in, in particular. And so, um, yeah, I, I did not know who I was without basketball. I mean, my self-esteem, my identity, it was yeah. all wrapped up in what I did on the court. And, you know, it was several hard years, um, you know, kind of finding my way. But I always tell people now, it's like, you know, the younger players that, hey, it's not ever about what you do. All of that can be taken away from you in an instant. It's who you are as a person. That's that's really all that matters. It's not what you do. It's who you are. And, um, you know, I, I learned that lesson uh, later. Um, and I, I, I challenge players because even if you do play professionally, it, you're always going to have another career. So don't be like me and not think <laughs> about anything else about yeah. how you're done um you know really try to start thinking about what other things that you're passionate about um and you know we all can have several careers i mean i was a college coach and now i'm doing something completely different so um you know there, there's a lot of time to work to be good at something else yeah yeah i was gonna ask you more on just your advice to to college kids because you know it's it's tough when you go out and especially d1 i mean our for us our meals were at a certain time you know you had your all your medical stuff was dealt with at the team facility. It's just so much structure to where you didn't really have to think about much in terms of what am I going to do with my day to day? What am I going to do next week? It's all laid out for you. So I guess what advice would you give to, to college players right now to, to be able to enjoy the moment they're in right now without, while also planning for the future and, and knowing that basketball isn't, you know, forever. Yeah. You, you have to, yes, you want to give, you know, your career, everything, you can give it, but you also want to be thinking about life after it and know yeah. that, you know, it, it will be a short window of your life. It will not last forever. And, you know, you have to kind of realize how you operate best. Like, you know, I do like you realize that I think maybe it's growing up in sports that I do better with structure. So yeah. if, if I'm in a job where it's, it structure isn't provided, then I know I've got to provide structure for myself. For myself. Yeah. Yeah. So just, kind of learning things that um, how you operate best, um, when you operate best, just kind of thinking along, along the lines of, you know, what makes your heart sing? I mean, other things that, you know, you could be passionate about after after sport. And, you know, for me, that my second half of my career is not so much about success. It was all about, you know, how can I be the best basketball player I can become? And mm -hmm. so many people sacrificed for me to do that. So then for me, it's, it's finding where my gifts a line where I can help the most amount of people. It's it's not success, it's significance. You know, how can yeah. I make a difference for others because people sacrifice for me. And I just think when you're younger, yes, it's more about you, but then your second half, it's like, okay, where, where can I align my gifts that I can provide a service and, and help the greater good? Yeah, yeah, I like the act two kind of thing. What, uh, so how have you done that since, yeah, I know you got into college coaching for a while and you're exploring a new business right now. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very passionate about, um, you know, fitness and also just mm -hmm. um, the basketball piece that I'm most passionate about is the development piece. Um, you know, if yeah. you look at me, I'm not very big. And yes, I was blessed with God-given talent ability, but I made myself through 
my workouts. And so it's fun for me to pass on, you know, how I did what I did to other players, you know, just with the skill development. So uh, I'm doing basketball camps and clinics and um, I've kind of found a niche where I go into a lot of towns. Like I just did 15 camps in three weeks and I went into most of those were small town, Kansas towns. And, and the numbers were huge because I remember I had to drive everywhere to get to things and Mm. bigger city to Kansas city or wherever. And so it's fun for me to go into these small towns and, and do it. And, um, you know, it's also just one day. So everybody's busy and has a lot of things going on, but usually they can commit to one day. And so, um, you know, that, that's been fun for me. I just feel like I've been able to impact a lot more people that way than I was in college coaching. I'm just kind of in this stage of my life, you know, aligning a little bit better with that. And then also fitness has been a huge part of my life. I always say, you know, one way, one thing you can control is how great a shape you're in. And, um, you know, as a basketball player, I always wanted to be the best shape of anybody on the court and, and fitness has stayed with me throughout. Um, you know, when people ask me, did I work out? I ask them, did they breathe? Did they eat? I mean, that's like yeah. how important it is to me. And so now I'm, I'm going to do a private personal training uh, studio. That's a franchise called Next Gen Fitness, and it'll be open in September in Springfield. So I'm also excited about that. I just feel like I'm really now kind of aligning my gifts to, to help people. Um, yeah. Yeah. What a cool next chapter. And you're in Springfield full time right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm in Springfield. And, and if anyone's ever, you know, interested in, you know, doing like camps or my lessons or next gen fitness, um, I have a new website at JackieStyles.com and uh, you can reach me through that. Cool. Yeah. And gosh, I mean, people should 100% jump on that because talk about <laughs> you can't find anyone else better to train you. Um, gosh, that is so cool. And so you're in Springfield now. Do you <laughs> drive by the statue of yourself often? No, well, it was really, um, <laughs> odd because I, um, you know, went to work and I had to walk by it every single day when I was assistant coach at Missouri State. And so it would be kind of a surreal. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Um, you know, I, of course, I've you know been given a hard time about that for sure. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I, uh, I love Springfield and I just, yeah. you know, I've had this struggle where I can't really live where my family lives. Like, it, you know, it's a small town. I can't really do what I do there, but it's the, you know, next closest thing. I mean, I've, I've so many great friends that feel like family and, and this community has given me so much through, you know, different things. I mean, they've supported me through my cancer journey. And so now to be back here and, you know, to give back to this community, I just feel like it's a really a right fit right now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind me asking how your health is doing? Oh uh, yeah. Um, so I um, just passed, um, I might get four years right now. Um, from being diagnosed with ocular melanoma and yeah. I go every six months for scans because it, this cancer has a high rate of metastasis. But so far I, you know, it's been clear, but the one issue I'm dealing with right now is uh, I've lost a drastic amount of vision in a, a pretty mm. quick amount of time um, mm. from the radiation that I had. Yeah. And I've been doing these um, injections in my eye to hopefully um, retain uh, some of that vision. So that's been a little bit of adjustment, but you know, I have good doctors, good support. So, um, you know, they, you know, help me through it. So, you know, if I, if you are waving at my, on my left side and I'm not uh, <laughs> reacting, it's because I have a blind spot there. Not or, personal. Yeah. Or if I look like I'm a little bit cold because I'm not acting like I know who you are. Faces are hard for me to see sometimes like yeah. gym lighting and stuff. So, you know, just adjusting to that, but still, you know, for the most part, most people couldn't tell. Now until I, you see me drive, but that that's a little. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> the other day, but anyway. <laughs> and you said so. You said you are cancer free. Uh, well, that they won't say I'm cancer free. I have sure. a tumor behind my eye that's dead right now. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know why with this cancer they don't let you say you're officially cancer free. Sure. But uh, so far. Uh, every scan has been clear. Um, cause it, praise God for that. Yeah. yeah it, it typically metastasizes to the liver. So, um, you know, I, I get that, uh, scanned every six months. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear things are going well so far. Yes. And, uh, I imagine the, the new endeavor has to be really exciting and in, in terms of, uh, you know, getting you through some challenging times, having something to focus on. Uh, oh, oh, for sure. Yes. And then yeah. just the, the way, um, the camps, like I honestly was just going to do a few basketball lessons until my gym was open, but now I'm completely rethinking how I'm going to manage the gym because 
this the basketball piece just exploded with the the camp yeah. and and it's something that I feel like I really need to do just because of the responses I've gotten you know from parents and just saying how you know their their kid I always challenge them to keep track of the amount of shots they make from when they come to camp to when they start school and they have to contact oh, cool. them know yeah. how they made and and I challenge them to get a journal or keep it in their notes in their phone if they have a phone and you know I've gotten emails saying that you know their their son or their daughter made them stop on the way home to get a journal to keep track of their shots and how you know it's it's positively influenced them so so that's been uh, really rewarding to hear those things yeah yeah and such a niche market that's so necessary to i guess a gap in the market to get these small towns um probably saving a lot of other parents uh some fights from driving four hours to kansas city yeah. but really if you're not in kansas city or wichita it's tough to find you know those opportunities sometimes and i mean training under one of the greatest of all time is hard to pass up so that is very cool you're doing that and i hope people check out the site and sign up um so are you going to do more down the road just thinking on it or oh, oh yeah definitely i'm, I'm yeah. going to make this a, a part of what i do um for as long cool. as uh you know people support it and i have uh campers but i actually have um a couple coming up in kansas um next week on tuesday i'm in uh, conway springs kansas and then on wednesday i'm in nest city kansas okay. and then in August 2nd, I have one in Kansas City, and then um, I have one in Larner, Kansas, towards the end of August. So still have a, a few more um, on the schedule for the summer. So Cool. Are you sold out, or do you still have spots open on this? Still have spots open, yeah. Okay. So JackieStyles.com if uh, you know, you're interested in potentially coming to one of my clinics. And I'll, I'll go anywhere. So um, cool. I'll also, if, if you're interested in uh, hosting one of my camps, um, you can get that information as well. So. Yeah, well, 1000% people should take you up on that. What an opportunity <laughs> for Kansas. Um, cool. Well, I don't want to keep you forever. Thank you so much for doing this. But before I let you go, I did want to ask you, the podcast is called Our Stories. And what an incredible story you have, gosh, from your playing career to, you know, everything you've done since and continue to do. If there's one thing people take away from your story, what would you want that to be? Oh, man, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, um, <laughs> You know, I would say that anything is possible. Like if you will, I'm, I'm such a believer in the growth mindset. If you will work at it and I get asked all the time, if you had to pick one thing that's the key to your success, what would it be? And I would say, hands down, work ethic. And, I, and I've seen it um, be effective in not just sports, but, you know, I've seen it with my brother who's now a surgeon um, who ended up graduating in medical school, top of his class, but but couldn't get in the first year. And he took an MCAT uh, test every weekend for a year and then ended up graduating with the top honor. So, I mean, if you're willing to work at it, you, you can pretty much almost do about anything, you know, um, but it also takes a, a great uh, support system. So so if you, you value your relationships and, and you work, um, good things will happen. Yeah. And you could go from Claflin, Kansas to uh, to the WNBA. <laughs> yeah, and I know it, it's crazy. And, and I would like to mention um, there, there's, there's a movie that just came out about my life. It's called uh, The Jackie Style Story, Anything is Possible, yeah. ironically. Um, and I just heard that it will be available on different platforms August 30th, like um, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, um, uh, some of those things. So uh, just uh, be on the lookout for that. It was, it was a fun moment. It premiered March 1st in Springfield. And uh, several of my um, coaches and, and different people that were involved in, in that even being a, a possibility, um, got to share the moment with me. And it, it, it was a pretty fun night um, getting to watch it. So yeah, it turns out I totally lied to you because I do have another question. And <laughs> I'm going to give you a bit longer. What was it like shooting that? And you know, that's coming out on some major platforms. That's that's huge. Uh, it, it was uh, crazy just because that, you know, yeah. a guy had contacted me out of LA and said he's a film producer. And you know, wanted to do my story. And I was like, is this guy legit? And then he had sent some stuff he's done like a 30 for 30. And I was like, wow, you know, he is. And so and when I was thinking to myself, you know, should I do this? Because you don't make money off of documentaries. They want to, sure. you know, keep the story authentic, you know, so mm -hmm. like, you know, it's, it's not like it's, you know, you're going to get rich off of something like that. <laughs> yeah. but, but I was like, you know, when I was 
contemplating, you know, do I want, you know, my story, my life out there for the world, you know, um, I was like, you know what, if it can help just one person um, be better and do more than, you know, is well worth my time. And, um, and, and I realized I, I didn't get to watch it until everybody else got to watch it for the first time. So it was a little nerve wracking, but um, Brent, the producer, Brent Huff did an incredible job, um, blew me away by how he um, told the story. Um, so, so it, it was pretty cool. Um, something I never thought, you know, would ever happen. Definitely a movie about my life, but. Yeah, well, you've inspired me and, and so many people in the Kansas City metro area and beyond Kansas and Missouri to the entire country. And the fact that there's just another way for people around the world to hear your story and, and your outlook on life and everything you've accomplished is good for the world, good for humanity. So I'm, well, thank you so much. I'm going to get to experience a new new thing coming up here next week. I'm flying to New York. Um, uh, the film got picked for the Stony Brook Film Festival. So I, I will be watching the movie with 10,000 other people at the Stony Brook film, F film Festival. So never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be going and being a part of a film festival. So it should be a yeah. pretty cool experience. So. Cool. Well, gosh, congratulations on that and have so much fun in New York. And, and again, thank you for doing this and for everything you've done. All right. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Thanks, Jackie.